Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another weekly episode of the PM Show. I am your host, Mandy Parsons, and on the radio with me tonight, I have our awesome stand-in co-host, who sounds like she might become permanent because John actually says he has a life sometimes, which amazes me. I don't know how they manage that, but I have Danica the Great with me. Always excited to have Danica with me. Danica, you're back. Yay, I'm back. And I have to say, what in the heck is a life anyway? Overrated. I'm a teacher. I don't have a life. <laughs> I don't know what that thing is. And I'll tell you, my day was crappy. And I, I think you said you had a hard day, too. Yeah, it's just I. How 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 can I really say this without going into too much detail? I mean, I'm not trying to be vague or anything, but I'm at this point in my life where there's just a lot of the big C word the change going around, and a lot of it is taking um, it needs patience. And you know, I don't know, you know what you know, I mean, Mandy, but I'm not a very patient person. I never have been. That has always been one of the biggest weaknesses of me. And I'm being tested in, intensively in my patients and my professional and my personal life. So it's, uh, you know, some days are good and some days are bad. Just, you know, trying to find, um, you know, trying to find that good balance. And, you know, if you want me to go a little bit more pure of the detail, um, obviously, basically, um, I'm trying to find, you know, I'm trying to find the job that will make that will make me happy, that will earn me, you know, not only enough money to support myself, but money to put aside money to start paying away some of the debts that unfortunately I have accumulated. Um, just, you know, I understand that most of us hate our jobs, and I'm well aware that I could very well hate the job that could be coming up. But you know, I'm just all I really want is just something that pay, that, that you know pays decently, has good benefits, because I have some medical stuff that I really want to get taken a look at. So, yeah, unfortunately, patients is just, I'm, you know, I'm putting my resume out there. I'm going to interviews. I'm doing really well. Um, unfortunately, it's Labor Day weekend, so, you know, I was told that a lot of the HR people that were going to be looking it over were on vacation. So, you know, again, another patient thing for me. So that's, that's basically what my professional life is about that. Uh, well, as everybody knows, I started a new job as a teacher a few weeks ago. I still love my job. I still love my kids. But it's one of those situations where I just feel really um, like it's tainted a little bit right now. Basically, there's a certain model and certain expectation that they want us to execute in the classroom. And being as I got hired the week before school started and the other teachers had more time to plan and everything and I'm in a brand new school and I'm in a brand new school district that I don't have exposure to. I mean, I subbed in a school district for six years that wouldn't even give me the time of day when I went to go apply for jobs. Even though I was told to apply for jobs by many of the principals, they didn't even call me. I was beyond bummed and felt like, they used me, basically. So I uh, I found this job. I got this job, and I love my job. I love my team. It's, uh, it's, it's great. But this uh, week, today, uh, I started getting things in order for what they call workshop model. And basically what they do is, is for an hour they do um, – different centers for writing, different centers for reading, and different centers for math. Well, math and reading have very specific centers, and they are so you're supposed to teach like a 15 to 20 what they call mini lesson and then disperse the kids into centers. To be able to do this, you have to inventory the kids' reading abilities. So I had to test the entire class to figure out what reading level they were on, which took all last week, and I didn't know how to do it and was told I needed to wait until – the uh, literacy coach could come help me do it. And by the time she could come and help me, I knew what I was doing because it's similar to one I had done in the past. So I got done last week. We're starting centers this week. We're trying to get kids in a schedule, and the assistant principal walks in today. She takes a look around. She asks me a few questions, and then she just leaves. And I was like, okay. That's weird. I felt really, really awkward. So I asked my team members at recess when we were out with the kids. I said, um, you know, should I be worried about that? They're like, no, don't worry. Everything is fine. It sounds like you're doing fine. Well, 
the view of the assistant principal through the assistant principal's eyes is often completely different, and this time it was no exception. I get an email at the last minute saying to come and meet in her office, um, and we had a discussion about how she was concerned with some of the things in my class. Now, if I was talking to other people, especially like people from the county where I used to work, those would be called coachable moments. I understand the lingo. I understand it sounds like we're sugarcoating, but there is a way to talk to somebody that makes them feel good about leaving the conversation on a high note, but realizing that there's a lot of room for growth. Mm -hmm. This lady was like, we have concerns. I'm going to give you a chance to explain yourself. And I'm just thinking to myself, okay. And I felt really, really rotten leaving her office. She's like, I don't want you to feel down and heavy. I don't want you to feel feel bad or down on yourself. I was like, okay. And I left her office. I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel like I was doing a good job. She told me nothing of what I was doing right. So it's already hard enough when you come into a circumstance where you don't get to to coach or train or set up as much as other people. And then there's specific a specific way that you could talk to somebody to make them feel better, but let them know we're here to help you grow. You know, I'm a brand new teacher. Yes, I've been subbing forever, but starting your own class is completely different than start, than taking over someone else's. Yeah, absolutely. And so did she actually tell you what she was concerned about, or she just said that I'm concerned with things you're saying but never actually directly pointed at what you were saying? Like, I don't like the fact that you called Mr. John here a knucklehead. We don't call people names. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I haven't heard that term in forever. Um, yeah, they actually did, and they actually want to help me. I mean, she was she was making it sound like she wanted to help, but it's just the way that she approached it. I know that it wasn't a screw you, you know, you're in trouble moment. I get that. And I understand that it was probably a, a we need to head this off now so it doesn't get worse down the path. I get that too. But I am a new teacher, and I am asking questions of everybody. But how can you ask questions? questions when you don't know that there are questions to ask. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's kind of weird, but well, I'm not really saying I'm sorry to hear about that. Well, it kind of just left me with a, a nasty feeling in my stomach. You know, I came home feeling down in the dumps. I mm-hmm. talked to a few of my coworkers. I talked to my mentors, and I feel better. I'm one of these people who will bounce back, and everything will be fine again, but it's just like Nobody wants to hear all the things that they're doing wrong. And then to have it stated as a concern, it makes it sound like you're deliberately doing something wrong. Right, that you have an untreatable issue going on. And that and that's not cool. I mean, if there's something that we are you know, doing wrong, we want to be told what it is. And to be like, okay, now that we have this bad habit, let's tr- let's work together, try and get that done. Here's what – and then follow up with, like, you know, here are things that you are doing very well. Your kids are, you know – really happy to be in class there, you know, talking high praise, you know, something that makes you feel like that, you know what, while there's a couple of issues that made me look at, you're doing awesome. Right. And I mean, it's not like I can, I can't change. She's like, we just want to see progression. We just want to see you grow. We just want to see things change. And I'm like, fine, you know, fine. That's, that's fine. I said, you will see improvement. I told her, you will see improvement. I am very, very hard on myself, and I'm not a slacker. Um, I I think the thing that really bothers me is that I am burning the candle at both ends. I mean, literally, I go to bed very late, and I have to wake up very early. And it's not sometimes that I want to do that. It's just I don't have enough time in the day. So I try to get there as early as possible. With traffic, it doesn't doesn't always work out that way. Um, But I was organizing the station where I sit in the morning and where my laptop is and where I prepare and get ready for the kids. And it was pretty much a mess. I mean, there was a lot of paper that I needed to dispose of and there were papers that needed to be gone through. And she came in while those papers were in piles on the floor. Oh, no. Talk about awkward. It was a. It was not a good day today. I mean, it, it just wasn't. And the kids, they were so much better yesterday. The workshop models were being implemented. I know how to do it. I know what I'm doing. It's just they came in on an, an unexpected poor day. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's just when one thing happens, then just, it just gets progressively worse than that. Yeah, so, yeah, that's what I'm down in the dumps about. And... 
I I figured, you know, I didn't want to go on the air tonight. I didn't feel like it. But I'm like, hell, why not just talk about it on the air? Unleash it. Let it go. Exactly. And, you know, just you know, hearing about others that day kind of makes you realize, oh, hey, I had kind of similar experience or, you know, not trying to make it sound like, you know, everyone's troubles are worse than others or anything, just thinking, oh, well, you know, she had it way worse than I did. I, you know, I should count myself grateful or something. I don't know. Um, I mean, the other day I was just, I got, I had applied for a position and I was pretty certain that I was going to get an interview because I, what my skills had and what the job offered matched perfectly. I was like, this is perfect. I have this, I have this in the bag. It was a bit more of a commute than I would like. I was like, hey, as long as the pay is right, I, I'll be able to handle it. So I sent in my application and a resume and I waited and waited and waited, never got a, never got a call, never got a response. Also, they get an automated email saying that they went with other they went with other candidates. I'm like, what the heck? Seriously? I'm like, everything totally matched. I did not even get a call back. I did not even get scheduled for an interview. I was just I I was just like, that's it. Like, I'm just I felt really down and down because I just had I have so much more bad things happening than good things, and it just really really put me down. And I'm just like, oh, and I sat down. I played a ton of video games and drank a lot more energy drinks than I probably should have. But, um, you know, it's just after a while, I'm just like, okay, I just got to get back on, got to get back on the horse and, and keep trying. I mean, you know, you gave me a lot of inspiration because I remember you saying you were trying to, even you had been trying to find a full-time job for, I believe you said two years. Is that right? Um, yeah, just about two years. Yeah. And so it's just, you know, well, hopefully it won't take me two years to, to I mean, I realize that your field is a little bit more, how should you say this, more selective or more um, competitive? Competitive, thank you. Uh, you know, being, you know, a new teacher stepping in when there's all these tenured teachers, that's not a very easy thing to do. So, you know, hopefully, you know, I realize that you had a much, much greater advantage than I do. Um, hopefully it doesn't take me that long, but I just, you know, I look at what's going on around, I look at my bank account, and I'm thinking, uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't want to be desperate. I'm just waiting for that perfect one but we'll see in a couple of weeks i suppose when all the hr people come back <laughs> oh it's true finding a job in this economy keeping your job and i was told today that the school district where i work is a huge school district I mean, it's incredibly big and it's divided up even further into smaller what they call clusters and I was told that our cluster is a particularly low cluster, like the children are poverty level. And oh, wow. many of them come straight from other countries and don't speak English. So the fact of the matter is that these children, they could be the brightest children in their native country, but coming to the United States and learning a new language might set them far behind. Yeah, I, uh, that, that's a that's a huge thing to consider. Yeah. Yes. You have a lot. You have a lot going for you. That you know, you know, definitely have your work cut out for you. That's for sure. I do, and I want to do a great job. But I, I also want to know, let these people know that I have a lot of talent and I'm doing a great job. You know. Yeah, I, I definitely do. You know, and just you know, I advise. You know, I. You know, and I. You know, we, you and I, have already had many discussions about public education. I believe that what you're doing is awesome for the public school education, but it's just, it's, it, can, it certainly cannot be easy with all of the pressure that you have against, you know, from the state, from parents, from kids themselves. It's just, uh, you, you know, you, I very much admire you for taking on that. That's not very easy. No, it's not. And most of my parents don't speak English. So you can imagine how I feel about making phone calls that I'm supposed to be making to their homes when they don't speak English. Oh my gosh. That's, Wow. It's it's just hard. It's just really hard. Wow. Well, I hope, you know, I'm sure things will get better. I'm sure they will, and they will improve. I just, I guess the overall feeling is that I don't want to be on administration's radar. Right, and I know that you don't want to, you know, be marked down, or I don't know if you guys use written up or marked up or anything like that, but I know that you want to do the best that you can and be recognized for what you have, and you know what you did? You know you told me of all the great things that you were doing in your class, lot, you know, last semester when you were subbing and all the kids that were doing it saying all these nice things means all these great things for you. So I, I'm sure this is going to be an awesome semester for you. I, I thank you. And, you know, 
speaking of, I want to move on to another subject, and it is dealing with education as well, but it's dealing with the ugliness that is the fat ratio of children in accordance to what the schools expect children to be. Oh, you mean like the obesity rate or something like that? Most definitely the obesity uh, rate. Uh, um, hold on, hold on. I think I hear the door knocking. There might be a Michelle Obama. Hold on. <laughs> is it? Is she there? No, no. Sorry, it was just someone. Flying, uh, it, it, was Jeho- it was Jehovah's Witness. No, it was someone that flew a flaming pile of poo on the porch. <laughs> so I shut it off. <laughs> uh, well, I have to say that this is an increasing and growing problem. And I really, really dislike this conversation simply because the first question we have to ask when talking about childhood obesity and body mass index is who is is setting the standard for these numbers? That's the first thing that I have to question. But the second thing that I also have to question is how do we know that these children are actually Obese. I mean, you say by a certain height they should weigh so much, but come on. You know, they said a five foot ten lady is supposed to weigh a hundred and four pounds. If I was a hundred and four pounds, I would look anorexic. Yeah, I would. I mean, you're very tall and just a hundred and four pounds. I was always told that, and this is me, you know, kind of for my mom. You know, I love my mom and everything, but she, for some of her standards and methods and things are slightly outdated because she's a baby boomer but anyway um basically she always told me that at about five foot a woman should be no like should ideally be around you know depending on her bone structure and everything like 100 pounds and then for every inch you add five pounds so five foot one she's 105 five foot two 110 and so on and so forth and that might make more sense than what they're trying to peddle now i just i think it's completely foolish and ridiculous that I am 5'10". I'm muscular. I mean, yeah, I'm overweight, but I'm muscular. I'm a big, I'm a big woman. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care what people think <laughs> about me. But the fact is I know that I need to lose some weight, but telling me that I'm supposed to be 104 pounds is just foolish and ridiculous. And so that leads me to this issue here. Now, the school district I worked in last year at the end of the year for two months with those kids that you mentioned a minute ago, um, I found out that, and that's the school district I graduated from high school, by the way. So this, I, this is my home school district. Oh, wow. Um, they now have a rule in place that before your child could have been registered for kindergarten this year, you not only had to have the standard shot records and you not only had to have um, a physical or all that stuff required, they're now requiring that children have body mass index tests done before you can register for school. Wow. I was shocked and appalled. Seriously, I know that some kids are obese, but again, how can you sit there and how can you say, hey, you know, your kid can't come to school unless he gets a body mass index test done. And what gonna, is that going to do? Like, are you going to publish it so he can be shamed by the rest of his classmates? Well, I'm just sitting here thinking, first of all, a lot some kids are still, they're, they're baby fat at the age of five. They're still growing, absolutely. They still have baby fat. They're still growing. They haven't come into their own. And I'm looking at this and saying, this is horrible. This is terrible. And there there are times before, like there was one girl, I forget which state it was, and didn't she have a body mass index test done? And they said she was obese because she was like a pound away from where, they said she was overweight because she was a pound away from where she was supposed to be. Wow, I, that that's absolutely ridiculous. I, our country is out of control when it comes to this. And the, the president's wife, she's not helping things. The schools don't get money if they don't promise to buy more things that um, are healthy for the kids. I mean, I've gone through the school lunch lines. I've been through the school lunch lines. And back at some of the schools that I went to in the county where I used to sub, some of their main entrees were nachos and soft pretzels. Oh, wow. Well, you know, with all the budget cuts that they're spreading these days, they have to make everything spread a little bit further, and it's cheaper to feed someone nachos and pretzels than it is apples and you know, cheese. Yeah, and the but the kids get to choose their own food. 
they give them options, and so the kids choose. Now, they have this new system where it's like if you have a red dot, you have to pick two fruits, two vegetables, one main entree, one grain. They try to level it out, but, I mean, we, we've gone as far as some of the schools writing to parents and saying, oops, we took away your child's snack because it was unhealthy. Yeah, that's not up for the schools to figure that out. I mean, parents should obviously be monitoring what their kids eat. And obviously, the, I, mean, I know that they can't if their kids are away at school. But, you know, there's got to be, you know, and, I, and I'm not a parent and I'm not a teacher. So maybe I'm just, you know, blowing things out of proportion. But you'd think that a parent, a parent would be like, okay, I want to make sure that my kid, um, but I don't know, like, is there some way for the school to be like, okay, here's two meat options. Either they can, here they can have chicken, let's say they can have chicken nuggets, or like ham, or like a hamburger. But then, but then the next row over, they have to choose either a fruit. They have to choose one of two vegetables or one of two fruits. Like, is there just is there something to do about like balancing that, or am I am, am I completely off my rocker? Well, let's just say today, for instance, in the school cafeteria, I usually bring my lunch because the school food is about $3 for an adult. Yes, they get larger portions. They don't really um, monitor their portions as an adult so I can get what I want. And there's a salad option and all that. But usually the adult entree is the same as the kid's entree. They get to pick between two things. And today their choices were, uh, what was the first choice? I can't remember the first choice, but the second choice was cheese stuffed breadsticks as your entree. What? Cheese stuffed breadsticks with with marinara sauce. Okay, 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 okay. So that has some protein, but are you kidding me? No, no, I'm not joking. That is pretty, wow. I didn't realize it was how, wow. Yeah, and like yesterday I did buy my lunch because I didn't have any time to cook and, um, their options were a cheese calzone, which wasn't too bad, but it was like the cheese wasn't melted. It was con- kind of congealed, but it still tasted decent. Um, and then they had chicken nuggets. So not so bad there. Oh, the other option, excuse me, the other option today was teriyaki or sweet and sour chicken or something like that on rice. Was it brown rice or white rice? Oh, it's probably white rice. I can't see uh, people doing brown rice. Um, but, I mean, that's what we're talking about. In school, some of them will get dinged because they aren't serving stuff that's deemed healthy enough. Get out of – just get out of your, your people's lives. I mean, it's it's not the responsibility of the school to police what the kids are eating. Not only that, but with our population – at our school, we have a lot of children in poverty, and sadly enough, some of them don't get three meals a day. Yeah, they go home and they can't eat. Some of them only get two if they're lucky, maybe even just one meal a day. But some of them, they I've had experiences in the past where they keep food and they take it home so maybe their brother or sister can get some food. I mean, it is a sad, sad situation. So when you're sitting here telling a kid, oops, your snack wasn't healthy enough, so we took it away to give you something else. You might be just taking away the only thing their parents could afford. Yeah, that I didn't think about it that way. That's just, I I agree. It's it's gotten way out of hand. It's none of their business to know what our BMI or what our skills are or what they should I just know. What you know. How the parents figure that out? Oh, that just that angers me so much. And I'm not even I'm even for like a kid. Well, here's here's an article that I read that that goes along with this. Apparently, there is a school district in the city of I'm going to see it, say it's Elyria or Elyria. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It might be Elyria, Ohio. They had a 40 year tradition where the school cafeteria would cook these, make these cookies. They bake these cookies. It's called a pink cookie. It included a pound of butter, six cups of powdered sugar, and the um, and, and it had like some pink icing on top. And people loved it. I mean, 40 years of a tradition, okay? They said that all snacks must contain less than 200 calories. And it says it's not exactly clear how many calories are in the pink cookie, but the recipe for frosting calls for a pound of butter. Somebody said, oh, yeah, we could change the recipe to make it under 200 calories, but it's not 
it's changing the cookie. It's not the cookie everybody loves. Mm-hmm. So apparently the USDA, you know, the trustworthy government um, organization that monitors all of our food, they set a standard called Smart Snacks in School that all snacks must contain less than 200 calories. That's who came up with that rule. So the school district, dissatisfied with having to cut it down to under 200 calories, banished it completely to comply with federal guidelines. They said we can either have the cookie the way it's supposed to be or we're not going to have it at all because anything less than the cookie we ate is not the same cookie. So it says we can't have them in the cafeteria for sale, period. Food Services Director Scott Tiemann told the Chronicle Telegram, the guidelines for snacks are very strict and there is no wiggle room. So the whole city is up in arms over this cookie. And this gentleman said, it's a tradition. It's not only a tradition, it's one that tastes really, really good. You'd be surprised by how many people are upset about the pink cookie going away. Anyone who's gone to Illyria schools in the last 40 years knows the pink cookie. So they call them comfort food. It's special to their community. The mayor said the cookie's demise is the talk of the town. The cookie has a cult following. Um, Apparently, the first one was made by a woman who was the food production manager for a very long time for this school district. And the recipe came from her mother. So she started making it, and it says that the recipe could, um, reading the recipe along could result in a sugar rush, butter, sour cream, powdered sugar, Crisco, granulated sugar. That, to me, sounds really delicious, by the way. Mm, So good. It's a homemade sour cream cake cookie is what it is. So they said they might start selling it um, on the side. It says, if it's so popular, why not change it so that it complies with federal standards? And the guy said, we did try to alter the recipe with whole wheat flour. You can get the pink cookie down to the number of calories that would make it allowable, but then it's not the pink cookie anymore. It doesn't maintain the integrity of the homemade recipe. They compared it to KFC's 11 herbs and spices, but I think even KFC has altered their recipe. It doesn't taste as good as it used to. No, I agree. And then... It does not deserve the name. And being, you know, an amateur cook and myself, that's absolute blasphemy. Yeah, so instead of pink cookies, kids are now able to eat things like fruits and vegetables and yogurt. <laughs> oh, Did you hear horrible. that? They get to. They get to. How they horrible. They get to, right? Um, and he said, that being said, I wish there was a way we could make those cookies available on special occasions. Everybody deserves the equivalent of a piece of birthday cake once in a while. So even the mayor suggested that there might be contraband cookies for the taking. They said, I don't think you can keep the pink cookie down. I think this is going to be like prohibition. Our school district is law-abiding, but I can see people who love this pink cookie trying to resurrect the cookie in other ways. So they're already planning to sell the cookies to local residents for special occasions, sort of like a confectionery speakeasy. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they have to be careful because if they want to try and sell cookies, they have to get a permit for that, so don't tell the government. Uh, Well, maybe they can sell them on Silk Road. No. (laughs) Well, I hope so. (laughs) You can get your marijuana, you can get your heroin, you can get your cocaine, and then you can get your pink cookie. Mm, pink cookie. It's really not a pink taco. Well, I'll bet you anything, the pink cookie would sell really, really well to the people who are buying marijuana. As long as, uh, you know, special brownies and pink cookies? Oh, heck yeah. Right? It says, meanwhile, youngsters will have to satisfy their sweet tooth at the cafeteria yogurt bar, thanks to the Obama administration's food police. Sorry, <laughs> kids. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Oh, that's the way the cookies come. Yeah, that's actually hilarious because that reminds me of something on um, uh, what you call it, uh, Robot Chicken. Uh, I don't know if you saw know that particular episode, but basically it shows the Keebler elves doing la la la, their usual thing, and also the Cookie Monster comes hounding through the forest and he's ready to eat all the cookies. And so the Keebler elves are ready, and they say, "All right, everybody, give the monster what he wants." And one of them says, "Diabetes." He's like, "No, not that. The other thing." So what they do is that they tack out the cookie monster and prop his mouth open. They dump all these cookies so that cookie monster basically oh. dies by exploding. And then it cuts to a court scene where the judge says, all right, verdict not guilty. 
and that's the way the cookie crumbles. And he just <laughs> wants to respond and gets really mad. And he's just like, my son is dead and you make pun? Me kill you. Me bleep me kill you. And yeah, if you get a chance, just go ahead and put that on YouTube. It's very, very funny. I will, I will certainly have to check that out, certainly. Um, but, yeah, so that's what's going on in our school district. And I'm so glad to know that education is not the top priority, but fat and BMI and pink cookies are. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's kind of the same with, you know, my old school is that, oh, we're going to give all the money and all of the top priority to all the football students and all the money is going to go to football because we don't care about education. It's like, thanks, guys. Thanks for making it harder for the rest of us by taking away our parking on class day is because, oh, there just happens to be a football game the very next day, but yet you have to kick us out of our, out of our parking a day early. So that leaves us, you know, up, you know, up whatever creek you want, trying to find a ride to school. And then, you know, oh, they're bringing us public and It's like, yeah, but you're, we're supposed to be quote unquote learning from you and you're, you're, you're screwing us over. It really sucks. Yeah. I noticed that a lot of concessions are made for people who play sports and all the people who bring prestige to the school. I mean, look at the gentlemen. I can't even say gentlemen. Look at the the students who have been raping other teenagers. What happens to them? They get, what, a slap on the wrist and they get to go back to playing football? Yep. Or the officers that get into trouble doing whatever it is that they do. And... You know, they're allowed paid vacation, and even times they're still allowed to just retire and keep all the benefits. What I do love is I remember when I was getting my bachelor's degree, I was in a Spanish class. And the woman who runs the Spanish class, she was trying to take people off the roster so she could make room for new students, for people who didn't show up the first day. And she took one guy off the list. She goes, oops, oh, well, there he goes, because he didn't show up. He came into the second session that week, and he said, hey, yeah, I'm in this class. And she's like, well, you're not on my roster. He goes, well, I should be. She goes, oh, you're the one I marked off because you weren't here on Monday. He goes, well, what did you do that for? I'm a football player. She's like, I don't care who you are. You weren't in my class on Monday. Wow. I was just shocked. I mean, we never hear about the – athletes and the other people who bring prestige getting just just deserve ever. That, um, that's just really sad. That's wild. I mean, he really expected special treatment because he was a football player. Yeah. And just they all get special treatment. I mean, how many stories do we know of, you know, the the top football or students' parents just bribing, if you will, the local authorities and news to cut them a break because, oh, their future is at stake. What about the poor girl that you just, like, completely ruined her life? Isn't her life at stake now? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. She probably did something to deserve it. She was she was asking for it. She was, she was probably asking for it. Yeah, she she was asking for it. We all know she's asking for it. So, um, I tell you what, though, on that happy, cheerful note, we're going to take a small commercial break, and then we'll be back to talk about whatever it is you wanted to talk about. Because I know you had some stuff to add in too. So the suspense is killing me. Oh, it should be fun. <laughs> you always bring in some great topics. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to play these um, commercials in just a second. Let me pull up the right screen. Yeah, we're going to play some commercials, and then we'll be back. Yay! Get ready for the epic new documentary adventure ride of your life. Shade the motion picture. Hub you into the globalist domain and embellish a Burma's film. Nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Nothing. Governments do not operate the way you think they do. Banks do not do what you think they do. The police department is not here for what you think it is. Nothing in your world works the way you think it does. We have never let them know that their world government has been identified and they thought they just closed the world economy to bring in a worldwide police state. But if they did it, it's going to bring them down. You have to stand up. Speak up, speak out. Shade the motion picture. Order your copy of the DVD today at 
Pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. Read about it in the Sovereign newspaper of the resistance. Available now at newsstands everywhere. The Sovereign is a monthly 24-page tabloid newspaper featuring incendiary content about life during wartime in the age of Obama. Warriors, keep to date every month. Remember to read the Sovereign newspaper of the resistance. Available at newsstands everywhere. This alert is for all you boppers out there in the big city, all you street people with an ear for the action. This is Mercy. If you're listening to this message, warriors, you are the resistance. This is Mercy. Mine will be the last voice you will ever hear. Don't be alarmed. Want to spread awareness to your neighbors, family, and friends about what is going on in our country today? It may be things you already know, like the large number of FEMA camps spread around this country to lock up citizens like you and me. What legislators are doing to strip states and people of their sovereign rights. Or legislation giving states the power to force vaccinate under a declared state of emergency. Do your neighbors understand what is going on? William Lewis Films offers the perfect tools to inform our population about this government's tyrannical shift from a constitutional republic to a despotic democracy. Films like 911 Ripple Effect, Beyond Treason, One Nation Under Siege, Washington You're Fired, Camp FEMA, Enemy of the State, Don't Tread on Me, Blood of Patriots, The Ron Paul Uprising, even 911 in Plain Sight, Williams' first production, are all available at williamlewisfilms.com. Get your DVDs today at williamlewisfilms.com. Educate against the police state. My name is Dr. Eric Norman. I have studied vitamin B12 deficiency for over 35 years. I have developed the urinary MMA test to detect tissue B12 deficiency early, allowing treatment and prevention of permanent disability. B12 deficiency can cause anemia, but also neurologic problems such as spinal cord degeneration, paranoia, and dementia. B12 is found only in animal sources, so vegetarians become deficient. As people age, they may not produce enough stomach acid or intrinsic factor protein for absorption of B12 and become deficient. Up to 10% of seniors may have a normal serum B12 level, but a tissue B12 deficiency, causing a three times greater risk for heart attack, stroke, or Alzheimer's. For more information, visit B12.com. And we are back. That was a great commercial break, and I'm glad to have Danica with me here tonight. And I just want to remind everybody that if you have any thoughts, if you have any suggestions, if you have anything you want to share, anything you want to talk about, anything you want to mention, if you just want to shoot the breeze because you are bored and you love to hear Danica and me talk, please call the number at 347-324-3704. We'll be glad to have you on the air with us, provided you're talking about something serious. If you're a troll, don't bother. However... Serious calls, please, 347-324-3704. Again, we'll be glad to have you. Now, if you are just now tuning in, you can catch us on Thursday nights, the rebroadcast of our show on the Voluntary Virtues Network, which is on YouTube, and it is everything voluntarism. It's, It's fantastic. We are voluntarists here on the PM show, and so we like to spread our message elsewhere. Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube. You can watch the PM show or rather listen to it from 4 to 6 Eastern. And that is on Thursday nights. So also, if you feel like choosing to engage with me in the chat room, we do have a chat room here on Freedomizer Radio. Just go to freedomizerradio.com. There's a little chat room button off on the right. You can press it, come in, create an identity, and come chat with me. I'm really, really bored in the chat room by myself. And I would tell Danica to join me, but Danica doesn't do chat rooms. It's against her it's against her religion. Yeah, sorry about that. I just can't come do it, Captain. I just can't do it. <laughs> so Danica is trying to reach uh the higher level of whatever religion it is that she really practices. Um something mixed uh, between worshipping Mickey Mouse and cannolis, I think. Wait, what about, what about Canoli and Mickey Mouse? That's what you're... Did I sound like Mickey Mouse? No, I said you worship something between Mickey Mouse and a cannoli. 
Oh, well, I just thought that was going to sound kind of like Scotty from Star Trek, and you were thinking that was a Trekkie or something. Oh, Which, no. Yeah, I kind of am a Trekkie. I mean, I'm not, like, full-blown Trekkie. I love, you know, the next generation and a couple of other things. But, I mean, I'd say that I'm probably more of a, um, you know, a Star Wars person than really Star Trek. But, yeah, I love both, you know, for both very different reasons. I think they're good. I don't think necessarily that those should be compared. And if anyone, you know, wants to ask why, I'd be more happy to talk about that. I'm not going to pick up the show at that because this is, you know, the PM show. This is not the Nerd Out show. So <laughs> I'll, I'll let that slide for now. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, you heard it here. Danica is a big fat nerd. Big fat nerd, fat and big. Yes, very, very much so. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I like lots of science fiction, and like lots of fantasy. I like just a little bit about everything. Oddly enough, you know, I'll you know say something about myself. I um, while I love seeing tabletop role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder. Love watching it. Love seeing what everyone does. I can't participate in them. Like I, I don't have the patience to kind of sit down. And I can imagine a character because I love drawing. I love imagining things. But I can't. I don't know what it is. So I just can't sit down at a tabletop RPG game and you know go around, let people take turns, and talk about it. It just I don't find it fascinating. I would much rather be um, like actually playing a video game, something that involves all my senses at once, or I would rather be observing people doing it. And that way I'm free to, you know, move around if I need to, or I can pull up my 3DS and play something else. Uh, yeah, so that's one instance of me where I'm not technically really nerdy. But you heard it here, folks. <laughs> well, I, I guess I have to jump on the bandwagon myself. On Monday night we were doing uh, Unity Evolved podcast. So do you want to give a shout-out to uh, the cast of Unity Evolved? I am one of the, the cast members, but uh, can the Liberty Phoenix – who we have here sometimes also as a co-host. That is primarily his brainchild, and he's got a producer. We have a producer named Hefland at hefland.com, and all three of us uh, did a, do a, a podcast together. They they started with it, and when I was, we'll, we'll kindly say when I was dismissed from another uh, well-known talk show host talk show, Ken said, come join our our cast. And that's what I did. So Monday night, I actually was broadcasting from Hef's house because come to find out this small liberty circle and it gets smaller every day. Uh, While Hef knows Ken, Hef knows me because I live only 45 minutes from Hef's house. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really interesting how that all works out. We didn't know each other until Ken introduced us and then come to find out that they only live 45 minutes from us. Well, for, no, for me, yeah, and then I found out he only lives six miles from my school. But <laughs> so even more fascinating there. But anyway, so I was broadcasting from Hef's house on Monday because we had open house, and um, it was just easier for me to to get to his house so we I could do the show on time. And we were talking, and somehow video games came up, and I was like, I love, love, love Super Nintendo. Mention SNES. <laughs> They called it SNES, and then they were like, like yes, or the original NES and SNES. And I was like, I have one of those. That sounds like something Ken. That sounds like something Ken would say. Cause I remember Ken like giving us such a hard time over World of Warcraft. <laughs> yes, and you know, I said, I have one, and the person said, you have what? I said, I have a Super Nintendo. Wait, you have an original or you have one of those those emulator things that can play any game? I said, I have an original, like the one that I got when I was in eighth grade. And it's in a box somewhere, so I know that it still works. It's just in a box somewhere. I just don't know where it is. But they were just like, seriously? I said, seriously? They're like, okay, but what games do you have for it? And I started talking, you know, I said, oh, tons. And Hef goes, tell me you at least have Super Mario World. I was like, of course I have Super Mario World. I also have Super Mario All-Stars, which was all the original Marios from the from the regular system that they made for Super Nintendo. And he was like, do you really? I said, yeah. And they're like, okay, what else? I said, let's see, Mortal Kombat. They said, which one? I said, all three. And they're just sitting here going, who is this? They're like, whoa, who knows your stuff? Yeah. I said, here's 
it's like, so these are the games I grew up with, you know, uh, Mortal Kombat, when you have the harpoon guy, and he's like, finish him. That's the fun Yeah, exactly. It's a fun game, and that little guy that pops his head up in the corner and goes, whoopsie. Fine. Rude. Kate. Sorry. I can recite the whole thing. Like. It's so great. That's why we are, are nerds. I totally own it. I told them, I was like, yeah, I'm a gamer. And then they were like, okay, do you have an account? <laughs> All accounted for. Yes, because I was like, I play Left for Dead too when we have a group together. And uh, they were like, wow. So totally right there with you. And I said, yeah, I've done the World of Warcraft thing and so, you know, a gaming chick. Hey, nerd. I prof- I profess it. Nerd. <laughs> Power to the nerd. I have that button on my laptop bag. It has a guy holding up a... He's got a fist, but it says it's a Super Nintendo controller. Wow. We have nerds. Now we actually... Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. John is probably going to listen to this and go, damn gamers. He, I know he's probably gonna listen to this and have like a hem, like a hemorrhoid, and he's probably gonna have an aneurysm and a stroke, all at the same time. He's like, "No, you're sabotaging the show. What are you doing?" Hey, we have hijacked it. We have taken over, and if he ever comes back, which is probably not going to be for a while, because it sounds like he's pulling his hair out at the roots, um, then we can talk about serious stuff then. But for now, it is the female two-hour session. Well, yeah. But, you know, just like we're gamers, we do like to talk about serious things as well. So I know that uh, we were discussing some of the things that you're going to bring to the table. So why don't we go ahead and and talk about one of the things that you wanted to bring to the table? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, All right. So serious business time. Uh, So I found this article the other day browsing around and I I thought it was very interesting because as we all know, there were a couple of stories this summer. Uh, they floored a mother who was arrested for letting her seven-year-old walk to the local park unsupervised, and another mother locked up because her nine-year-old was playing at their neighborhood park in South Carolina. So I brought this up because you had initially brought up the whole thing about, you know, kids having these kinds of things horsed on them, which, you know, shouldn't have any play in this. And this kind of hit home to me because I could remember – being unsupervised for a lot of things, but at the same time, a lot of things I did, I was forced to bring my siblings along. But So this post by uh, Petula Dvorak from the Washington Post is titled, Why I Let My Children Walk to the Corner Store and Why Other Parents Should Too. Of all the adventures my lucky children had this summer, swimming in two oceans, hanging out with their bearded uncle's commercial salmon, fishing boat, and with popsicles, the biggest one they told me was just 490 feet away in their own D.C. neighborhood. They got to walk to the corner store on Capitol Hill by themselves. Clutch your pearls, America. The boys are 7 and 10. Apparently, I could be arrested for this. Uh, she goes on to mention the uh, that we've seen the criminalization of childhood in- independence, um, such as the Florida mother arrested for letting, letting her 7-year-old walk to local park and the other mother locked up because her 9-year-old uh, was playing at the neighborhood. So this this next part actually really disturbed me. A recent poll conducted by the Reason Rope magazine said that 68% of Americans think there should be a law prohibiting children 9 and younger from playing in a park unsupervised. And 43% think the same about letting 12-year-olds that kind of freedom. What has happened to us? My generation grew up, after all, with scratchy yarn and a house key around our necks. We walked home, let ourselves in, and played until our parents got home from work. I rode nearly a mile on my bike to get groceries for my mom when I was 8. I walked down one street and around the corner to the bus stop when I was in kindergarten. My dad left me and another kid in the car when we were four while he visited my mom at the coffee shop where she worked as a waitress. We ate. Yes, you heard that right. We ate his cigarettes, but no one adjusted us. So four-year-olds do not smoke. They just eat things because we're four years old. They, they don't know any better. So at the current judgment upon parents were in place, my folks will spend my entire uh, childhood in the up. Yes, there are scary people out there. It is always theirs to let your children on your side. But truthfully, the most dangerous thing you do every day is drive anywhere with a child. About 300 kids are hurt daily in car accidents. An average of three are killed that way every single day. 
Um, yet we don't see police pulling parents over and locking them up whenever they see someone in a car seat. But you know what? If they're playing on the monkey bars without mom or dad nearby, well, they got to get booked. Uh, now, here's the next, the next part of the article, which I thought was really interesting. So, there, so she interviewed a grandmother who said, it's a different world out there. It's not like when I was growing up. And we'd all play in Apple Orchard and we were safe. Today, you just don't know out there. Yes, it is a different world. It's a safer world, but we just don't feel like it because we know too much. Back in the Apple Orchard last few days, there were plenty of child molesters, killers, and pervs lurking around. It wasn't talked about, and nobody heard what they did. News about a tragedy in Tallahassee didn't make your Wheaties in Portland seven days a week. So, and then, you know, going, you know, and I'll, you know, go to the next part of the article in a little bit, just um, some statistics. But, um, you know, I wanted to pin that question to you, Mandy. Um, were you generally unsupervised as a kid growing up? Yes. I mean, my parents would always be like, go, go out and play. I, I was one of those kids during the summer who wanted to stay in and read. I mean, I was a nerd. I like to learn. So <clears throat> I was a... Uh, I was always told I needed to go out and play while the parents, you know, cleaned the house and took care of business or wanted some parent quiet time, whatever the heck they were doing while my dad was at work. But so they would always say, hey, go out and play. And there was nobody worried about where we were. If we were going to a friend's house, we just had to let them know where we were. But otherwise, they wanted us to spend time outdoors. And they always said, when we were kids, we were out from the break of day till the sun went down. And nobody ever questioned them. They were always just out playing with their friends. Times were a lot safer then. That's a yeah, that's an interesting thing that you bring up. Uh, I remember, I don't think my parents used this methodology on me, but I've heard of parents telling their kids, okay, when the streetlights come on, you need to be home. So either they had, either as soon as the streetlights came on, they had to be on their way home, so they had to be home within a few minutes of the streetlights coming on, or they had to be home in time for the streetlights to come on. Now, sometimes it was a little bit harder to tell, you know, depending on the time, but, you know, most kids had some sort of watch or some way to tell time because, you know, we didn't really have any kind of cell phones um, kind of around those days. Now, to some degree, I was Super, unsupervised a lot as a kid. Um, when growing up, we I grew up in the I grew up in a military family, so we moved around a lot. But I remember one of the houses that we lived in had like a very small foresty area back, uh, in the back, near the backyard, and I would play there a lot. Um, sometimes I was like, you know, I'd grab a book and I'd go out and read because you know parents wanted me out of the house, you know, get fresh air and not be around. Uh, so to some degree, I was unsupervised. Um, many times we were, you know, we were allowed to go walk about two blocks up the street to the uh, elementary school playground. We were able to put on the playground, play on the grass. Um, when we had a dog, we were allowed to walk the dog by ourselves. And, you know, I lived in all the neighborhoods I lived in growing up were, you know, suburbanized. Uh, you know, I'm sure stuff happened there, but for the most part, we were really kind of left by ourselves. Now, as far as actually venturing out of the suburban, suburban neighborhood, uh, that was a little bit of a different story. And um, when I was a little girl, I uh, I had an experience where I was molested by a much older boy. And since then, I was not really, I, I guess the word to say is allowed, but anywhere I wanted to go by myself, if it involved anywhere outside of the suburban er, neighborhood they lived in, I had to take someone with me, whether it was my sister or my brother or someone had to go with me. So my mom was, you know, aware of things that could happen, but she was okay with everything with me being by myself in the neighborhood, but anytime I had to go out. And it got especially annoying growing up and, you know, when I was 16 and 17 and wanting to go out with my friends or wanting to celebrate later, no, I have to take my sister with me or no, take my brother with me. And that's when it got really, really frustrating. Yeah. It's But see, times were safer. You could take your siblings out. You know, I'm the oldest of five kids, and I grew up technically with two of them. But you could do that, and, and it would get annoying, I'm sure, taking them. This woman is taking a big risk. What about that man whose son skipped, what was it, missed the church bus or something like that and went and played in the park instead? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. There are instances where kids are just kind of – thoughtless and dumb and they decide to, oh, I'm not going to go to school today or I'm not going to go to church and I'm just going to go and play and they don't 
tell their parents or something. And you know, there's you know a couple reasons why they don't tell. Obviously, the parents are going to be upset and say, no, you have to go to church or you have to go to school and maybe force them to go or punish them anyway. I mean, either way, the kid knows that they're going to be punished in some way. But, you know, when the parent gets a phone call, oh, Johnny didn't make the bus or Johnny wasn't here today, then, you know, they, you know, call all the hounds, call the police officers to get that done. But uh, according to this article, since 1983, the number of children 14 and under who were murdered is down by 36%. And for children 14 to 17, murders are down uh, 60%. So, yes, I agree that times were different back then, but in some ways it's made it better because obviously we have the Internet now. We can spread messages faster. But I also believe that, you know, like that, you know, also with the increased technology, we're fully aware of what can happen out there. Back then, it wasn't really talked about. I mean, growing up, I wasn't I wasn't really, you know, talking about like, you know, perverts and pedophiles and things like that wasn't really about very much. It was kind of like hidden away and not really brought up unless something happened. So, you know, to some, you know, they were definitely different. I wouldn't necessarily say they were different in the terms of safety, but I think just knowledge and awareness. Well, everything is the parent's fault these days. Did you know that? Everything is the parent's fault, just like everything is the teacher's fault. If the parents are at home and the kids are at school and they're misbehaving and they're not displaying certain behaviors that they feel the child should be displaying at that age, well, it's the parent's fault because the kids didn't have home training or it's the parent's fault because they didn't teach their kids this trait. I think that we have gone too far with requiring things of students that are not age appropriate. Yes, if your children can handle it, please, please push them past what's considered age appropriate if if you can, absolutely. But we need to be okay with saying, hey, they're they're technically supposed to be here, but they might not just just might not be ready for that threshold. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to, you know, go slower. Maybe they'll catch up later. We need to be okay with that. But everything is the parent's fault these days or the teacher's fault. It's because we try so hard to push them so hard. Yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely correct about that. And speaking of the parents' fault, I mean, in this absolutely horrible economy, it's forcing many many households to have to take dual income. So typically, you know, it was usually the mom that would stay behind as a stay-at-home mom. You know, in recent years, there have been a number of fathers that have decided to stay at home, whether they work from home or just decide to be stay-at-home fathers. But, you know, with the way the economy is and, you know, the expenses, lots of families cannot, simply cannot live on a single family income. And, you know, both parents have had to make the choices to work. So then it comes down to, okay, well, typically, unless parents are making very, very good money, usually at least one of the paychecks is going completely to child care. So it's just like, okay, well, do we pay for an after-school program or do we pay for a babysitter to watch the to watch the kids until we come home, well, then that completely defeats the purpose of someone taking on the expense of another car and, you know, take, you know, t- taking another job elsewhere. What all it's going is just paying babysitter fees. So, you know, in, in some degree, there needs to be an awareness to be like, okay, well, the child should come home and lock the door and, you know, he's allowed to do whatever he wants. He should be doing homework, but, I mean, the kid might be watching TV. I mean, we all know what we do when our parents aren't home. Um, as long as they just stay home. They don't have any friends over. They don't open the door for anyone unless it's, you know, one of their other siblings coming home or anything like that. I mean, that was kind of the, you know, that was kind of one thing that a lot of families had growing up was that there was that kind of system that both parents were working. Now, I grew up in a single-income home where only my dad worked. My mom worked for a very, very short time out of the house, but that was very short-lived because, actually, funny story, <laughs> we, we proved that, we could not be left alone because of the shenanigans that we pulled, but that's a story for another time. Uh, so, I mean, I wish there would be, if that's the case, that parents need to utilize some sort of, you know, stay home mechanism. If their kid can't be trusted to do that and the kid is just going to go and do something, well, then, I mean, that's a whole other issue that the parents have to take on and that, you know, again, should not be the state's or any other's decision to make. I mean, if your kid's a troublemaker, you need to, you know, try and find a way to do that rather than just, you know, find the parents. You know, they need to find a way to balance that. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You were talking about the kids getting away with stuff at home. Uh, you know, these days, you can get arrested for leaving your children home alone. You know, <laughs> there's no such thing as a latchkey kid these days because they could be arrested. And I remember when I was in elementary school, my mom decided to drop in for lunch. We were home alone, and she decided to drop in for lunch. We had a friend over. We had two friends over. And oh, then, boy. They went and hid in a bedroom. <gasps> and she didn't go and and go into the rest of the house. So she came and ate with us, and we sat at the table. We acted like nothing happened. And those poor friends of ours probably sat there for like 40 minutes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I, you know, now that you tell that story, that brings up something really funny. So my mom, like I said, she you know worked for a very short time outside the home. I'm... I'm not sure why she, what her reasons were wanting to do it. My, I believe my dad was making pretty decent money at the time. I mean, as I, like I said, I grew up in a military household, so um, you know he we lived near the base and he worked on the base. But so so he was you know away from the most part. My mom, I believe, either just wanted to bring in extra income or she just wanted to, you know, be able to get out of the house here once in a while. And we were you know we were getting older. Um, I believe the ages of us were like. Uh, I want to say like 13, 12, and 9, something, you know, old, you know, old enough that it's like, okay, well, you may, you're you starting to get to the point where you should be trusted with a little bit more responsibility. We don't, don't really need a babysitter right now, but it was that really kind of in-between period where you're not sure. So my mother <laughs> said, okay, I." she sat down and she said, okay, I am going to run to the store and was getting something like really basic. She's like, I will be gone for no more than like 20, 30 minutes. She's like, you know, you don't need to come with me. It's just a short trip. And we all know that she took two years with her. It was probably going to be more trouble than it was worth. But she said, just stay, you know, stay in the house. You know, don't, you know, don't go outside. Just, you know, read. We didn't really have a TV. It was like, read, watch a movie, just, you know, do whatever you want. And, of course, <laughs> being the way that we were, um, with absolutely no supervision in the house, my brothers proceeded to tie me up in a sleeping bag and pour the best sauce down my nose. Wow. Now, uh, and granted, it wasn't the whole bottle. It was more like three or four drops. But still, if anyone has ever had anything of that nature poured down your nose, you know just how sensitive and how painful that can be. Oh, my gosh. I don't even want to imagine. Yeah, so screaming and crying. And soon enough, my mom came home, and she was less than pleased. So but yeah, we were not left alone for you know for a long time after that. And rightfully so, we yeah, I'm sure. I don't remember what I did to allow myself to get into that habit. I don't think my brothers were mean enough to just like completely take advantage of me and tie me up. I'm sure I had some sort of hand in it, but yeah, I'm just I I could I cannot believe even at this point how it got that far and how they thought it would be even in the best interest of everyone to to pour Tabasco sauce down my nose. But, uh, yeah, needless to say, we were not left unsupervised for a very long time after that. No kidding. That could have been, that could have been like, a medical issue. Oh, absolutely. Think if they had poured more, I mean, I maybe would have lost my sense of smell. Possibly, or maybe it could have leaked into your eye sockets. I mean, seriously. I know, and then I could, like, cry tears in Tabasco, and then I wouldn't be able to smell how good you smell in the morning, Mandy. Mm-mm. Oh, so sweet. <laughs> But yeah, so I, you know, going back to the whole, you know, letting kids supervise. I mean, you know, you know, where do we draw, where do we draw the line? I mean, you know, maybe some kids shouldn't be trusted to be by themselves. And if you know that your kid's not trusted to be by themselves, surely there's got to be some sort of neighbor or you know, lots of families that live near their relatives. But is there you know a neighbor or a friend that they can stay, or even an after school program like a boys and girls club or a YMCA that they can go? You know, or surely they can go over to a friend's house until the parents are done. I mean, there's just there's tons of options. I mean, why does arrest have to be part of it? I don't know. I just our our whole world. Everybody knows what to do with our kids and our bodies more than we do. You know, we don't have individual freedoms anymore because everybody else had to say, "Oh, it's in the name of safety. It's in the name of liberty. We can give up a little freedom just to protect our lives." Well, oh, it's just, you know, and, you know, speaking of which, uh, you know, I know I, know I had mentioned there's got to be some sort of neighbor or friend or even a child's friend that they can stay with. Um, even then, like, it's been proven that our biggest dangers are the people that we know because they know our habits, they know, 
you know, usually to some degree know our schedules, where we're going. I mean, how many, you know, kidnappings or molestations have come from a friend or a family member? I mean, there, there's just drastic numbers of that. So, I mean, really, you know, your biggest your biggest risk is just the people that you know. But if there is someone that you can actually trust, such as, you know, a you know grandparent or even if the child can go to their friend's house, I mean, surely there's got to be some way to go about this than just criminalization. Well, I mean, that's that's the generation that we're dealing with. Like I said, everybody knows how to run our families and raise our children better than we do. The government knows all. The government knows better than than everybody else. Yeah, I suppose so. They're just you know, big brothers watching out for you and just looking out for you. It's just, it, it, it's very sad. I, I agree that, you know, people should be aware of the things that can happen, but, you know, again, stop worrying. You know, you have a bit, you have a bigger risk of, you know, wanting, you know, your child getting hurt or killed in a car accident because there's tons of people that shouldn't drive, but we let them drive anyway. Exactly. Exactly. We do let them do that. And I'll tell you, we have a lot more stuff that we should discuss, uh, but we're going to go ahead and take another commercial break. So just stay tuned and don't go anywhere. And Danica, have those stories ready to go. All righty. I am an autonomous government agent here to steal your livelihood. Not so fast. I'm Sovereign Filing Solutions. And I'm the Sovereign. We're teamed up. To bring you... The truth without censorship. Are you tired of being fed multi-million dollar media lies? Are you ready for the real story? Sovereign Filing Solutions has teamed up with the Sovereign Newspaper to make sure you get it. And not the BS this guy behind me wants to feed you. Take the step, help make the change. Oh, come on, that's not even fair. How are we supposed to rule indiscriminately if you know what's going on? Want to spread awareness to your neighbors, family, and friends about what is going on in our country today? It may be things you already know, like the large number of FEMA camps spread around this country to lock up citizens like you and me. What legislators are doing to strip states and people of their sovereign rights. Or legislation giving states the power to force vaccinate under a declared state of emergency. Do your neighbors understand what is going on? William Lewis Films offers the perfect tools to inform our population about this government's tyrannical shift from a constitutional republic to a despotic democracy. Films like 911 Ripple Effect, Beyond Treason, One Nation Under Siege, Washington You're Fired, Camp FEMA, Enemy of the State, Don't Tread on Me, Blood of Patriots, The Ron Paul Uprising, even 911 in Plain Sight, William's first production, are all available at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Get your DVDs today at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Educate against the police state. Hey, Freedom S, join me, Proof Negative. Weeknights, 9 p.m. to midnight Eastern, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific, as we fight the new world order together. Right here on Freedomizer Radio, your exclusive home of the Proof Negative show. seem to be going wrong in the world today. Every aspect of our lives seems to be under attack sometimes. Many struggle to make sense out of it. What is really going on? Identifying the problem is critical to any solution. Many people claim to have answers. But what is the truth? What works? What has worked in the past? History does repeat itself, and you must learn from it. You have choices. We cannot change the course of history, but we may change our role in it. All roads lead to Rome. All roads lead to the kingdom of God. The question is, which way are you going? Join us to make sense out of it all in the Sabbath hour at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time or 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for an iconoclastic look at the world yesterday, today, and tomorrow and hear about the keys of the kingdom. Are you curious about what's going on in your life? About what's going on in life in general? About what's going on in the world? Politics, health, science, religion. Who are Freemasons? What's the Illuminati? What is the government? And what makes it up? Who's in it? All these topics and all this information are knowledge. And knowledge is power. Here at Thrice a Daily Download, we give you that information. We download it straight through your ears into your brain. You are the one who needs to be receptive. 
So join us Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 11 p.m. Central Time. That's 2300 for those who love the military time. Join us and don't miss out on your daily download. Here on Freedomizer Radio. This is Colleen, and I'm the host of Freedomizer's newest program, Project Socrates. Join me every Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 Eastern, to discuss everything from geopolitical affairs to health, cuisine, culture, gender roles, philosophy, art, and so much more. My guests will include a wide variety of leaders from their respective fields, and the phone lines will be open for your questions. Be sure to like Project Socrates and Freedomizer Radio on Facebook. See you on Thursday. I'll be expecting you. And we're back. Those great, amazing commercials. Just want to remind everybody that you all can join us in the chat room at freedomizerradio.com. There's a little link off to the side, a little tab. It says chat room. Create a name. Come in. Keep me company. I see nobody in there but me. And let me tell you, it's kind of hard to have a discussion in a chat room by myself. Um, it kind of gets a little weird, too, because I'll start talking to myself. Um, so come join me. I guess is the moral of that story. Also, you can call in if you have any thoughts, views, questions, comments to share. 347-324-3704. And just a reminder that if you're just now tuning in, you can join us on tomorrow night's show. Uh, It's going to be a rebroadcast syndication, if you will, on the Voluntary Virtues Network at YouTube.com. 4 to 6 Eastern, the PM show. You don't want to miss it. I promise you, Danica, tell them they don't want to miss it. You definitely don't want to miss it, and you really should go in there because I, I really can't go in there because it's against, it's against my religion. I just, I have this thing against, you know, chat rooms. I just can't do it. It, it would be, it would be blasphemy and sacrilegious. So go on, you know, keep her company, tell her jokes about cookies and trolls and keyler elves and stuff like that. That'd be really awesome. Yeah. So no chat room for you. No chat room for you. No room for you. Yeah, but but we have lots of other stuff to talk about. So why don't you tell us what's next up? Oh, okay. So I'm going to be shifting the focus now from you know people being scaredy cats and not letting their kids out because, oh, man, so many things can happen to them. And we're going to go to a topic that has been hotly debated in the last few days. Uh, have it your way as far as sex um, avoidance. We all know that the bur- that the big BK, Burger King, is leaving the U.S. or is in the process. I'm not sure how long it's going to take or if they've already done everything. Uh, but Burger King is leaving the U.S. over the tax rates. Uh, also, ironically, they're paying $11 billion to buy the giant Canadian chain to importance, which, you know, I'm, by the way, I'm not being paid to say this, but I love Tim Hortons. They have very good coffee and very good donuts. And now that I've gotten them out of the way, um, so a couple of things I wanted to, I wanted to ask. Uh, basically, Tim Hortons is Canadian equivalent to Dunkin' Donuts, meaning that they're everywhere. Um, I'm actually surprised that Burger King has that much revenue to purchase Tim Hortons because uh, back you know where I lived earlier this year, uh, there were quite a few Burger King chains that were shut down. Uh, there was maybe one or two left where I lived, and I you know I lived in a city that was like 200 plus. But they basically closed, I want to say, two or three chains and left only two chains open. Now, I wonder if this, they were just trying to, they were preparing to leave and therefore, you know, cutting, you know, underperforming stores and just wanting to get that out of the way to free it, it for their, um, you know, for the, for the more prosperous chains. Because obviously they're not, they're not going to stop operating in the United States. They're just going to be funded in Canada to avoid paying tax to the U.S., uh, so before I go on to my, yeah, I had a couple of points about this. Uh, so the first point I wanted to ask is that, um, is it, I mean, we have a lot of people, I apologize, I'm just going to be kind of all over the board, and I'm sorry if you're listening to this. But basically, the people seem to be divided on a couple of things with this Burger King thing. Um, some people are claiming that it's unpatriotic because, oh, how dare an American chain leave us and go to a an American place? You know how unpatriotic of them to not pay taxes? That's terrible. They should leave. Um, another side is that, 
Well, I think that's great because if you all remember what it was like when America was first founded, we all came over to America to avoid paying taxes to the king and England. So, you know, not paying taxes and protecting against taxes has, you know, by definition, kind of always been an American foundation. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of on the rocks about this. I mean, I you know think it's great that they're avoiding to pay taxes on this, but my other concern is something else I'm going to bring up after I uh, discuss this with you. So, um, how do you feel about this, Mandy? Like, what's your what's your opinion on about this? I don't really care. I mean, not that I don't don't really care about the article. Um, smart business people do everything they can to make more money. Isn't that right? Absolutely. I, you know, as a business major, that's absolutely. They, you know, they obviously want to try and build up the revenues, and you know, if they can do that by not paying the high taxes in America, then awesome. Well, I mean, not only that, but come on, I'd be more concerned if it was actually a product that meant something. It's Burger King. <laughs> yeah, but they do have chicken fries, so let's not forget that. Yeah. Do they still have them? Oh yeah, they still have them. Huh. Well, I don't. I don't do chicken fries and I barely do fast food as it is. Yeah. So yeah, no, not for me. But um no, I, I will say that uh out of all the fast food joints, I am a sucker for a whopper every once in a while, even though they they're horrible. All of that fast food disgustingness is horrible. But they found a way to make more profit. Why why wouldn't you take that opportunity, especially if they're not doing anything illegal? Right, it's it's not illegal to move it out elsewhere for that. Um, you know, where I live currently, there's there's this there's a street that has two fast food places um, right right beside each other. Wendy's and McDonald's. Now, McDonald's is open 24 hours. The drive-thru is anyway. Um, I'm not. I actually know the lobby is open 24 hours too. Um, the Wendy's is open late. It's not open 24 hours, but. Anytime I drive past there, there is constantly a line for for both of them. The McDonald's has two lanes. Um, Wendy's only has one. Uh, but they're constantly busy. They're constantly having cars in and out. And and right across the street from it was a Burger King. The Burger King was closed uh, late last year, uh, almost a year ago now at this point. Um, and according to some people that I talked to, was because it was in a performing that they got a lot of um, – I guess leftovers from people that were tired of wanting to wait at either McDonald's or Wendy's and came there, which really kind of surprised me because you'd think that with McDonald's and Wendy's being extremely packed and long lines all the time, that Burger King would have at least gotten, you know, helped even out some of the things. I'm not sure, but I guess it was one of the more underperforming of the stores and just what, and it really is kind of in a weird location where you have to go about and the drive thru is all weird, but I. You know, can't really describe it other than that, and it just sounds weird. But that was obviously one of the stores that was underperformed. Um, two or three locations back home where I'm from also closed, most likely due to underperformance. Um, my only concern with Burger King, and I have to agree with you there, that I don't eat at Burger King enough to real. It's just kind of like shrug, whatever. It's just, you know, it's no different than Sara Lee. You know, also now being headquartered in Dublin, Ireland, to avoid paying U.S. taxes. But this this is my only concern here. If Burger King, Burger King Corporation obviously felt that it was better to, say, pay taxes in Canada than U.S., which seems kind of weird because Canada is it's pretty expensive. Um, the taxes there are very high. I know they pay their employee – most minimum wages in the provinces are pretty high, and they tend to you – know, there's obviously all that universal health care and all those – you know, all that neat stuff that they get. But – the taxes, from what I remember, are pretty high, and their gas is very expensive because they go off liters rather than gallons. So my question is, uh, aren't they going to be paying more in taxes to the Canadian government by moving over there? Um, I mean, obviously, they think it's better to either pay it to Canada or it's not as much as the United States. So that's my only concern. I would be, I would be uh, curious to find out what taxes would be for a chain over in Canada. I would be interested in finding that out, too, but do you know the difference between a business in the United States and a business in Canada is that Canadians, for the most part, don't mind paying the extra taxes because of the perks they get, like nationalized health care, which, to me, 
I still don't want nationalized health care, so it sure. wouldn't be worth it for me. And trying to shove it down our throats, you know, we have to accept it here because it was passed. But um, from what I understand from my Canadian friends, that they don't mind paying the taxes so much because it goes for the greater good. Right. Yeah, and I, I recognize that too when I've been over to Canada is that um, – you know, they, they just seem to really be okay with all the perks there. And, you know, that's all, that's all fine and dandy. Um, but you know, it's just, you know, looking at the different sales receipts, it's just crazy just how expensive. I remember sales tax being like 11% at one point. You know, it can be very expensive. But at the same, at the same time, they're able to pay a pretty high minimum wage. Obviously, they already have minimum, they already have a um, nationalized health care, so they don't have to worry about health care benefits. But I just, you know, when it comes down to it, it comes down to um, it comes down to utility. You know, what is worth it to you? What are you willing to pay for? And I suppose Burger King just figured that it was just much more cost effective to have it headquartered in Canada than uh, the United States. And good for them. Like, if I don't even know why this is, this is a an issue. I don't know why this is an article. Why did we have to report on this? Who's who's complaining? Did it say who's complaining? It's not really so much complaining. I mean, it is kind of a big thing to happen because obviously Burger King and McDonald's have been staples of us for years and years because they're two of the biggest fast food corporations. And obviously a lot more of the patriots are upset because they think it's, you know, un- they think it's unpatriotic of them to leave and not pay taxes to, you know, it's kind of the same thing where a lot of businesses have been outsourcing out to India or to China for their products because they can get more for a better price. You know, lots of patri- you know, lots of Americans have boycotted them because they don't support um, su- supporting uh, the Chinese grip over our monetary system. They, you know, don't feel that it's, you know, they think it's un-American essentially. So I believe, you know, that that's probably the, one of the biggest stirrups out of this. And also, you know, Tim Hortons, like I said, is the Canadian equivalent of Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, it's a very, very large chain. So Burger King and Dunkin' merging together, I mean, that's just – that's going to be huge. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, kudos to Burger King. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Michelle Obama had something to do with it and making the taxes so high so that they would leave because it goes against her no junk food agenda. Oh, of course. That that, that would be, you know, the, the anticlimactic scene at the end of this play. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, hey, Burger King, good good luck to you and your good use of business savvy. Certainly, you know what I just you know like you know like I don't have a Burger King in the area. You know the closest one to me is like an hour away, so it's certainly not something that I would frequent often, even if it were near me. Which thinking, you know what? Hey, if you feel that that's best for you, awesome. You know, I'll, you know, obviously you're probably still going to have change here in America, and you're still going to be providing jobs. So, good for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Now I'll tell you, a lot of the controversy this week has been coming out of no none other than Ferguson, Missouri. I know you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes, I do. Everybody knows about it. I am ashamed to say I probably don't know as much about it as I should, but it's another Trayvon Martin situation from what I understand. Um, it's a very uh, – it definitely has a lot to do with Trayvon Martin and, you know, the racism that is towards blacks. Um, Also, a big degree of it is, you know, police brutalism and uh, militarization where a cop shoots an unarmed person and the person just so happens to be uh, a black person. I mean, I'm sure it would be it would be just as controversial if he had been Hispanic, Asian or white. But, you know, because he because he was a black or African-American, I'm not sure what is more politically correct is. It's just. It's it, you know, just exploded with controversy, and rightfully so. I know I've talked about how racism is alive and well just by the name that someone has. Well, I will tell you this. There is a Missouri state senator named Jamila Nasheed. Jamila Nasheed. Speaking of names, you can tell. Yep. Okay. Um. Yeah, so she's requesting that St. Louis County Prosecutor Robert McCulloch step down from the case involving the shooting of Michael Brown by Officer Darren Wilson. And she wants him to step down because he's white. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's see. It says, but that's not racist. You can only be racist if you are white. 
And, of course, Nasheed won't say that's the reason she wants him to step down. Well, not in so many words, anyway. So, apparently, McCulloch can't be objective because his father was a police officer who was killed by a black man. That happened about five decades ago. And she went a step further to say that Megyn Kelly from Fox News noted to her that McCulloch was just elected DA in a county where the majority of people are African American. She said, it, so it does seem clear that he has the confidence of the people that live in that county. And she, Nasheed replied, not of the African Americans that live in that county. And Megyn Kelly said he was running against a black woman. He defeated a black woman. And she said, guess what, Megan? He didn't get the black vote. Well, he didn't get the black vote, so he can't possibly be trusted to prosecute this case faithfully. Oh, of course. Okay, the thing that kills me is that they just made it clear that the African-American population of that area is a majority. So this guy had to have had the African-American vote because... It's a majority African American, and he won, so he had a majority of the votes. Oh my goodness! So I'm saying this is this is ridiculous. Our country has really, really come to this, and it is so, so sad and pathetic. But I mean, here we are talking about this this racism thing in our country. It's not just in our country. It is it's blatant. Worldwide, I mean, there was um, a president, which one was it, uh, Mugabe, president of Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. He has ordered that, let this article pull up. He ordered white farmers off of the land of Zimbabwe. What? Yes, yes. It says on Wednesday, Zimbabwe president, and I think this was um, from a few months ago. Uh, yeah, this is actually from July, so, but... Uh, I thought it made an interesting sidekick to the article I just read. Um, He told white farmers that they must get off of the land because his nation is not a place for white land owners. But aren't they, um, like, bringing crops and produce and good good things to Africa? Uh, It says here that there are white farmers, and this is a quote, there are white farmers who are still on the land and have the protection of some cabinet ministers and politicians as politicians as well as traditional leaders. I have been given a list of 35 white farmers in Mashonaland West alone and in just a few districts that have been audited. We say no to whites owning land, owning our land, and they should go. Okay. Well, racism is alive and well, folks. He also said he went to clarify went on to clarify that whites could actually own in his homeland. They can own companies and apartments in our towns and cities, but not the soil. It is ours, and that message should ring loud and clear in Britain and the United States. And he called Minister, um, Prime Minister Tony Blair a boy from the streets. Well, you know, <laughs> oh, I want to so badly show this joke, but, I mean, really, you know, you know, we, you know, we, we had a lot of you know, African American slaves working the lands as slaves, and they are they want to go back to working the lands just themselves. Let's let that sink in for a second. Do you know what I learned the other day? In fact, we were t- I'm teaching the Civil War to my students, and I learned just the other day, not by teaching my students, but from another teacher, that what they don't ever tell you about the Civil War is that. Seven percent of slave owners were black people. Wow! So black people actually owned black slaves. Yeah, they did, and some they didn't treat them as poorly as the white people had a reputation for treating them. But yeah, that seven percent of them were, and we already talked about plenty of times how Abraham Lincoln was a horrible man and how he sacrificed the lives of thousands of Americans to push his agenda. He didn't like, he didn't care anything for the black people. He just wanted to free as many as he could so they would vote for him in the next election. Yes, absolutely. I did not know I did not know that black men were able to keep black slaves. That seems kind of counterintuitive. Well, like the teacher who informed me of all this said, the people who win are the ones who write history. Oh, it's very true. Very, very true. Yeah. So 
a rude awakening there and uh, the things that they don't ever teach you in the public schools. Well, I remember hearing, um, and I don't know if this, you know, I, I believe this is true, uh, but basically nations differ on like who technically won, you know, I say won with quotation marks, World War II, um, you know, our our books teach us that, you know, we, you know, we bombed uh, Hiroshima, uh, got a surrender from Japan, that was done. The Chinese write that, oh, you know, the Chinese were forced to surrender or they burned this and that. Italy writes something different. Germany writes something different. Like, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy just how different they do. They, they, they're viewing it from their, from their eyes, their way that they want their children to learn. Yeah, it, it's amazing. It sure is. That's just well. So I mean, what? So any other new things from Ferguson that you've been finding out lately? Anything that pops out to you specifically? I have not. I know, like I said, I have not been uh, paying enough attention to that whole scenario. But it, it's kind of like I don't know who's right. I really don't know who's wrong. And until we have something to go on that gives us some solid information, I, I don't really know what to say about it. Yeah, I I mean, there was a video uh, just last year. I believe I was, I was actually talking to you about this because we were calling and we were talking. Um, there was a man that, and Cop Block actually did a story about this too. There was a man who allegedly had stolen a couple of energy drinks or soda drinks from a convenience store. So the, so the convenience owner calls the police on him. So the man is, and this is being filmed. I'm not sure why the person was filming it, but I guess, you know, whatever else people film for. So the man is walking, like pacing back and forth, walk, talking on his cell phone, having his, his drink with him. Police, police show up. Uh, the man starts walking towards them. Now, now the guy does have a knife in his hand. Like there, he does have a knife in his hand. However, it is at his side, and he is walking calmly towards the officers to tell to talk to them. They shoot him dead. And this is all recorded. Like, you can see everything recorded. Now, the police are saying in a statement that they feared for their lives. The man was charging at them angrily with the knife outstretched in overhand position. And it's clear by that video that they are lying and that the man was in no way, you know, maybe he was a threat by walking up to him, walking up to them, but he was in no way charging at them. He was, like, three meters away, not three feet away, and he was not charging at them with an overhand. So the police are lying to try to make themselves look better. And here they are trying to shoo people out of this common area where this convenience store is, and the convenience store man no doubt lost business that day thanks to those police officers shooting that man who, you know, whether or not he stole something was in no, no way a danger to anyone. Also happening in Ferguson. Wow, yeah, it, it, this is getting out of control. And I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they're like, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next election. And I was like, if there is another election, and they're like, isn't that a little over the edge, you know? And I was like, well, no, not really. And they said, well, what do you expect could happen? And I said, I very feasibly and plausibly see the president calling martial law. I mean, this is just the first step. I was like, Ferguson, Missouri has martial law. Did they not call martial law on Ferguson? I believe they did, yeah. And everything else that's been happening, did they not call martial law on those places that got hit really badly by uh, hurricanes? Uh, there was martial law in Thailand, I believe, for a short time when there was that uprising. And that's what I was saying. He said it sounded, for lack of a better term, a little tinfoil haddish, but... I fully believe that they're going to pull some garbage before the next election and something could happen. You know, I just, you know, I do believe that we're on the brink of another, some sort of revolution, whether we overthrow the presidency. I mean, I do know the um, the Republicans are planning to sue Obama for all of the you know, empty promises he's made, all of the lies that have been going on. Uh, so, you know, we're living in a time where the the CIA has admitted to hacking into the Senate's database and computer systems, and uh, the Republicans are in you know, the Senate are planning on suing Obama. I mean, you know, when does that ever happen? I mean, is this is this on the same scale as the Watergate scandal and you know all those scandals that happened back in our parents and grandparents' time? I don't know. 
Well, the thing is, and it's funny that you say that because I do have an article that says former judge confirms that Obama could face jail time for breaking the law. You know, and all these articles are saying this. Where there is smoke, there is certainly fire. There's a number of articles saying this. Uh, But nobody wants to try this man. Nobody wants to bring him to trial. There was one article that I read that said he was subpoenaed to come to court, and he never showed up. Oh, my gosh. Anybody else who does that would go to jail. Mm -hmm. This man is is above the law. Obviously, that's what he thinks. It says, former judge confirms that Obama could face jail time for this major crime. President Obama has a knack for breaking the law, an activity that he seems to excel at, along with his ability to party the night away while innocent journalists are beheaded by terrorists. Months ago, Obama, without the consent of Congress, negotiated with terrorists for the release of Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl in exchange for five high-level Taliban leaders, a move that many both in government and across the country felt was an extremely was extremely foolish and dangerous. Bergdahl, it turns out, is a likely terrorist himself, as evidence points to him deserting his post, seeking out the Taliban, and potentially helping them to kill American soldiers. On top of the huge moral bungle, it appears that the deal Obama struck with the Taliban is also highly illegal and could leave the president staring at the inside of a prison cell. Okay, right, right, sure. Okay, you are have all this information. You have all of the details. You have all of the proof, but nobody is going to try this man. You know as well as I do that nobody will try this man. Well, I mean, he's just, unfortunately, he's just gotten too powerful. I truly believe that the people that are serving under him are afraid of what he would do to them as well. He'll have them murdered. He would have them killed. How many times have people tried to speak out? And then just suspiciously they disappear. Yes, or they just they stay silent too because they just they they fear for their jobs. It's it's just it's a it's a crazy time that we're living in. Like it's you know I you know looking back at the history books or where you know where my nephews nieces will tell you know will ask me oh what have you know what you know tell me about you know that big scandal that happened. You know, tell me about the um, you know the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Tell me about you know, the President Obama, and it's just, you know, it's just going to be really interesting what comes with this and what, you know, if there are future generations and such. I'm not trying to be all tinfoil hat, but, you know, and, but at the same time, at the end of this presidency, I wouldn't be surprised to, you know, see something really anticlimactic, like, you know, maybe he will stand trial for what he's done and some things he's did. Maybe, you know, I, I know that just because he's left, the presidency doesn't mean that things are going to get better. I mean, people that believe that, you know, I'm sorry, but you need to wake up and smell the coffee because the the things that every president has done has long-term lingering effects. He just can't end eight years of total destruction. No, you can't. And, you know, I, I really, really hate to say this, but he's doing a good job, such a good job of pushing the agenda of the puppet masters. What is to keep him from finding a way to stay in even past his two terms. Well, I mean, that's a that's a good point. I mean, Clinton doesn't really have too much of a hand of what's going on. At least Mr. Clinton doesn't. Miss Clinton, on the other hand, is obviously trying to get her way into the presidency, and you know she's been very outspoken on the Senate, so she's you know had something in it. But you know, I don't know. Is Michelle Obama going to kind of stick around and be part of the Senate and you know push further into politics? Is she going to try for president? I don't know. I mean, you know, and who knows what, and George Bush, for kind of the same reasons, doesn't really have any sort of involvement. I believe he's kind of an ambassador and has gone on different kinds of trips, but for the most part, they just kind of don't really get involved that much. Well, all I know is that there's a lot that can happen in the next year or so, and we should keep our eyes peeled. All this stuff going on in our country is just a distraction from what they are trying to do and what they're trying to get past. Yeah, I mean, it's very, uh, how should I say this, it's, it's a very trying and very rapidly changing movement that we are in. And, yeah, I don't know, like, I'm, you know, again, I'm not trying to be all tinfoil hatty and telling people we need to start 
bunkering down, but, you know, be prepared for some very, you know, different changes coming up. Absolutely. Now, I tell you, we're going to take one last brief commercial break, uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to close out with our with our last segment. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Yay. Lindsay Williams on Freedomizer Radio. Same things are happening so fast now. And, again, I want to thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be with your audience and with you tonight. Everyone out there in your listening audience, they should listen to you every single day. Don't you miss a program. Lord bless. Everybody sit that spiritual house in order. It's the most important thing out there. Thank you, and good night. Hello, everyone. Proof is here. I want to let you know about our latest promotion on our FreedomizerRadio.com website. Our chat client, Bark, B-A-R-C dot com, is hosting a micro-Bitcoin giveaway while supplies last. All you have to do is go to freedomizerradio.com, join our chat room, create a screen name, and type to your friends. And some micro-Bitcoins will fall from the sky. Not only that, the more people that are typing, there will be some random lotteries as well. So just for typing to your friends, you can earn some micro-Bitcoins. So who knows how long this will last, but join us now, freedomizerradio.com. And we're back. I told you that was going to be very brief. We have one more segment, and I just I just want to shoot the breeze a little bit, but I'm going to offer this first. Apparently, there is a dating show on VH1. This is the uh, what I guess is called the funny, lighthearted segment. It's really ridiculous, actually. There is a dating naked series on VH1. Oh, I, it, yeah, I know where you're going with this. This is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it started on, on July 17th um, on VH1. I don't watch VH1 anymore because I don't have cable. But apparently this contestant who was on this reality show is suing because she was shown naked during an episode. Oh, no, the horror. And, you know, after that very, you know, serious conversation we had last segment. I think this is very, very welcome. So, I, you know, also to the matter, oh, no, she was shown naked, the horror. Naked on a naked dating show? Oh, my gosh. What a concept. Who would have thought? Now, uh, okay, so because it's cable, I know they're allowed to show asses or butts, whatever. I don't know if one I'm allowed to say or not. Um, I know they're allowed to... I know there are a lot of show butts. Um, I, to my knowledge, they're not allowed to show like breasts or other genitalia. But is she claiming that they specifically shot some genitalia and and breasts, or what? What exactly is the story behind her freaking out about this? Uh, it says that Jesse Nizowitz, I probably mispronounced her name, but I don't care, is suing Viacom as well as the producers of Dating Naked for ten million dollars. She was humiliated on social media with horrible messages after producers assured her that certain parts of her body would be covered during a wrestling scene. She says when the show aired, viewers were treated to the full Monty. She says, my grandma saw it. I saw her this weekend, and she didn't have much to say to me. She's probably mad. My parents are just annoyed. Um, hon, your parents are probably annoyed because you joined the cast of a naked dating show. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I joined the Cast and Naked Dating Show, my parents would probably never want me to talk to any of their friends or anyone about it because they'd probably be very embarrassed. I mean, they'd get over it eventually, but they would be like, really, honey? Really? Yeah, and it says here that Nisa with his attorney, Matthew Blitt, re- released a statement to Entertainment Weekly stating the following. Although I went on this show knowing that I would be nude while taping, I was told that my private parts would be blurred for TV. If you watch an episode, you'll see that the blur actually makes it less revealing than a bikini would. Obviously, I did not expect the world to see my private parts. This is not what I anticipated or what any other contestants on the show anticipated. So on top of the money, she wants a huge apology from the network. She claims the show cost her a budding relationship with someone she had been seeing for a month who never called her after the episode aired. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, let, let's face it. Reality shows are not really reality. They are rehearsed. They're reacted out. 
I'm sure some things are thrown out there that may not have necessarily been scripted, but for the most part, it's pretty all planned out. Um, yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of feel bad for her for wanting, you know, for you know, going on that, going on that show for that title. But I mean, she has no other land but herself at the, at the end of it. So true. So very true. I, I certainly wouldn't put myself in a position like that. I just. I mean, for one, I don't have nearly that much confidence. And for two, you are putting yourself out there literally for the world to see. And it would put a bad mark against anybody who wanted to hire her, who looked at her history. I'm not sure that I would be comfortable hiring somebody who was willing to bear their body on, you know, national, maybe international television. That's a very good point because if you think about it, these celebrities that go on these big name rounds, just such as I mean, I mean, naked dating, I think is relatively new from what it sounds like. I, you know, never heard of it otherwise. Um, but like the Bachelor and the Bachelorette, I mean, there's so many people that follow these and watch these that, you know, once you're out there and exposed, you really, it's going to be really hard for you to try and find other venues other than the entertainment industry. I mean, I know. Some of the more like vocal characters on Bachelor and Bachelorette have gone on to other very cheesy, you know, B movie style like wrestling competitions and reality shows, and that's just pretty much what you're going to be getting into when you're not. And it's sad and unfortunate, but it's very true. Oh, absolutely. But not only that, but when these shows, when you agree to go on these shows, you are disillusioned if you think that these um, producers and show editors are not going to edit your role, edit your part, edit your scene to show you and, and portray you as, as a certain character. You know, how many times have we been told that a character on a show is a total bitch because they edit her, edited her to be that way? Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, when someone is a, is a particular certain way that it's going to come out anyway. But, no, you're, you're correct. I mean, I don't know if you ever uh, – <laughs> if you ever watched The Hills or whatnot, I um, I watched it like every now and then because where I was living at the time, uh, we had free cable. And when, you know, I was also at that stage where I was working and going out a lot. So, and going out and partying and going to, going to clubs and bars. And so that kind of show kind of spoke to me. And I remember we were going through just the, that social change. And so, I mean, I watched it i was kind of thinking okay you know this is kind of real but at the same time i'm not sure and then you know at the very end of the show and i'm not i'm gonna i don't know if anyone really cares if i reveal a spoiler but at the end they just kind of you know they it pans out and you see that it was just a lot of it was just staged and you know even the characters even the actors and actresses have come forth and said yes many times we were told that this was how we're shooting a particular scene and I had to look very upset or I had to look very angry or I had to be like overjoyed at something. And it's just, it's so true that, you know, reality shows have a way of like clipping and editing and putting things together that make it look like a character is, you know, more temperamental or innocent or something. And it's just, ah, it, it's just, it's so the misleading. It's a, it's a, it's a character smear. Yep. I mean, honestly, it's a character smear. And if you try to get a job, people are like, weren't you that lady on that show who was totally crazy? Yeah. Oh, you know, you're that, you know, you're that giant bee, and it's like, not really. And as and and the other thing to think about it is that, you know, for example, these girls go on these show, and they're they're fairly young. They're in their early twenties, you know for the most part, but then, like, years later, they've changed because they're no longer that person, yet everyone's still seeing them as, oh, you're that terrible person that, like, kicked and punched and pulled that girl's hair. And it's like, yeah, no, I don't do that anymore. I'm, you know, I have a kid. I'm, you know, trying to get my business going, and you're holding me to the standard that I was five years ago. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I just, I wouldn't want to put myself out there. I certainly wouldn't. Now, while we have a, a few minutes left, I do want to give a shout out to Mr. Proof Negative. His show is coming up next. Like I said, we do have about five more minutes, but it's always good to get this out ahead of time. Uh, his show is on from 9 to 12 Eastern. That is 6 to 9 Pacific. You guys should stay tuned. It's three hours long. Never, never telling 
no telling who is uh, going to be his guest tonight, and he ends up usually having some interesting people. So you guys should stay tuned and listen to him. And he's on four nights a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And sometimes I help him out on Tuesday nights as his co-host. So stay tuned for that. But Danica, it's been a pleasure having you, as always. I love I love broadcasting with you. Oh, it's always so much fun. We just get to you know, hang out, rant, go about our personal lives, and then we can get into some serious stuff and then get into some fun stuff. I mean, it's awesome. I do hope that both of us have better experiences with our jobs tomorrow. I know that it is going to be hard for me to walk in there with my head held high feeling like I did nothing wrong. Yeah, I I know, and it's just, I you know, coming back and knowing that, you, you know, people are aware that there is something going on about you, whether you were talked to or something. It's just, it's uh, it's such an uneasy and uncomfortable thing to go through. I've gone through it. I'm sure you have too. And it just, just let it stop. Let the awkwardness stop. Let me get seasoned and not have to worry about this so much. Well, the thing is, is right after that, I was um, in my room trying to pull down the bulletin board and uh, I, I talked to one of my coworkers. I called her over and I explained to her what happened. The look on her face was shocking when she heard that I was talked to by the assistant principal. Oh, and, wow. you know, I, I told all my team members what happened, and I'm just like, they know I'm frustrated. They know things are rough. They understand. So it was very helpful. They said, don't worry, we'll help you get up to par. Um, I'm not a perfectionist. I never claimed to be. I just try my best like anybody else. And know that when the time is right, everything will fall into place. Yeah, just uh, just bad times are going to come and that, you know, just always keep a positive mind. Know that you can only go up from here. You can't go down. You have the tool to make yourself a better person. And, you know, you're changing people's lives every single day. I appreciate that. And then there's people like you who go and make treks across the country, barely knowing what you're getting into, taking a risk and hoping to find a job, especially in this economy, it's rough. And you did that and you're still overcoming. Yeah, it's, you know, this, I knew that this trip wasn't going to be, you know, heart sparkles, ponies and rainbows, but it has, like truth be told, it has been one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Hopefully, I see a light at the end of the tunnel very soon, and hopefully, I can truly get back on my feet and find out if this is really working for me or if I need to try and do something else. Well, I mean, you do have the support of friends, lots of friends there who you previously only got to see maybe once or twice a year, and now you get to see them a lot. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's you know, I do have a pretty helpful community here. And then there are times where you just feel like complete isolation because everyone has already been here before and has their own thing going on, and then you just feel kind of alone. But not too often. No, not too often. Um, And it is a nice little community that you guys have there going up in New Hampshire. So um, I do want to say thank you again for being on the show. I want to say thank you, thank you as always. I hope that you uh, join us again next week. And I want to thank the people who are listening I hope you guys will stick around and listen to the Proof Negative show. I'm going to end us out with our friend Harrison Ray and his song, There is Love. Thanks again for listening. Check us out tomorrow on the Voluntary Virtues Network at YouTube. And uh, take care. Have a great week. Bye.